everybody. It's Rob. Uh, again, it's our second week off. It was WrestleMania weekend, so we did not have shows this week. But as I promised you last week, we're going to have more content for you because I've been able to get some stuff in. Last week, uh, we sent you all my panel from Retro Expo in Allen, Texas with Don Bluth and some of the animators and voice actors he's worked with. This week, we're going to focus that a little bit more with Philip Glasser, who I've worked with before, who was the voice of Fievel in An American Tale, and Dan Molina, who was also part of An American Tale as an editor, and he is also the voice of Dirk the Daring. We'll talk about that a little bit as we follow up with last week's panel. And for those of you that are fans of the Cheap Podcast, listen all the way through. There's a great story that Philip tells about working with one Randy Macho Man Savage that I think you're going to dig. Next week, we've got another one coming as we get through the holiday weekend, and then we'll be back in the studio on April the 16th. Cannot thank you enough for being a part of our empire. We'll talk to you soon. Enjoy this panel from Retro Expo in Allen, Texas. Guys, give some love. Phil Glasser and Dan Molina here. Hello, hello. Great conversation this morning with everybody. And I kind of want to pick up a little bit where we left off with the timeline with you guys. Now, Dan, do you go back before American Tale? Because you had said you were a fan, but didn't you work on the short before all of this happened? Yeah, I was, uh, it was back in 1979. You guys remember that year? No, um, I do. I was in the first grade. It's good. <laughs> uh, but I worked. Um, so I was invited by a, a fellow at that time. It was a guy named Dave Spafford, who was an, an animator over at Disney. And he was telling us about this guy named Don Bluth, who worked at Disney. And a group of Disney animators were going ahead and making a film, a short film, in their garage and in their house. And I was like, you know, wow, really? And he said, you know, you, you, should, you should come down. So I went down there with my brother, who uh, his goal actually was to be an animator. Um, so we went and uh, I, that weekend, and Don had literally converted his house that was in Culver City, California, into this little miniature studio. And they were rediscovering a lot of effects, a lot of things that Disney had since forgotten from the old days or had not put into their films. You know, high, um, things about you know treating underwater um, the way that uh, they would do in Pinocchio or whatever. That it's just methods that Disney thought was too expensive. So Don wanted to rediscover, and he wanted to go ahead and put those back in in films. And he was always kind of trying to trying to champion it over at Disney. So they did this experiment, this short featurette called Banjo the Woodpile Cat, over in his home, and I j- it, I just I went over it, visited them, and that was it. I was like, this is it, films for me here. And um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I ended up becoming an editor. Um, But back then, I just was glad to go ahead and help them out in whatever way I could. Um, And so we were working nights and weekends on this short film. One thing, story that Don did not tell, we were talking about cells earlier. And you know, cells are extremely expensive now were thousands of dollars. But Don had, in his living room, while we were working there, he had a framed picture from the classic, like Sorcerer's Apprentice, you know, the word mm. Vicky's like that. Yeah. And it was just two frames off of that classic pose. Oh, God. Right? So it was, you know, it was almost the exact. And so during the course of making this film, Don's house was robbed not once, not twice, but three times. And they took a lot of stuff from his house, but they never took the cell off the wall. They probably looked at it and went, eh, cartoon. Um, It was worth the most money. Yeah, worth. It was worth so much money back then. And then Don actually gave it to Steven Spielberg as a present after American Tale. Um, But the thing was, you know, it was probably, back then it was probably worth about, you know, over 100 grand. Now it's priceless. A million dollars, at least. Yeah. But I always thought that was amazing that these you stupid burglars. <laughs> yeah. I used to love going to the Warner Brothers stores and I would just spend hours in that back corner where all the oh, cells oh, were, I all know. of the things there's, I would never afford as long as I walked God's green earth. Yep. And I miss that. I miss those 
when you could go to the mall to the Warner Brothers store or what yeah. turned into the Disney store because that, that last run was not great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to go off topic a little bit because both of you have extensive work now with Spielberg. Have you seen The Fablemans? I have not. I have it. I have the screener and it's almost time to vote so I probably need to watch it. I, I got a, a screener as yeah. well and he talked about, uh, Don talked earlier today about Spielberg's uncle. His, his grandfather. His grandfather, his yeah. Um, seeing that Judd Hirsch, I believe, plays him in the film. That's a good point. And that is where, to me, that film picks up. Hmm. So I, I will be interested down the road as we probably interact on social media of what you guys think of that film and how it reflected maybe your experiences with Spielberg. Because if it's one thing we know about Steven Spielberg, animation, kids. Yeah. That's his jam. You know, talk about the experiences, and you and I have talked before, you were very, very young. Yeah. So, yeah, so did you even have that concept of who this guy was? Well, I mean, I knew who he was just because I just saw E.T. So, you know, it's like, that was like, that came in, and, you know, he was, even then, he was still becoming a very large director, but I, you know, and Amblin was growing, and, but like I said, I've said before, like, animation wasn't huge. It was kind of a weird time for animation. And before American Tale hit the box office, I want to say Snow White was probably still number one at like 27 million or something like yeah. that, right? And then American Tale comes out and does almost $70 million in 1986, and people's minds are exploding. Yeah. That you can have this is way before the Disney train. Now, keep in mind, too, just to add on to that, $70 million back then. By today's standards, people go, $70 million for an animated film? And it, it tanked. Uh, mm -mm. Back then, seventy million was probably like nine hundred thousand, nine hundred million. Yeah, now, to a billion dollars, or to a billion dollars. So it was unheard of. To, yeah. to put it in frame framework, that's about the time where I started in the workforce. Yeah, minimum wage was three dollars and twenty five cents an hour. Yeah. So if that tells you anything and gives you the framework of what ninety million is, it's, and that movie really did take the world by storm. It did. And we talked a little bit about that this morning where, where you said, like, I knew we had something. And I kind of want to go back to something you and I have talked about before, too, because when did it become real for you? Because there's, there's a difference here, dynamically. Uh, for me, it was, prob it was probably the premiere. I'd never been. I was you know, seven, I think, at the premiere. And it was, you know, they did a whole big Hollywood premiere. There were stars there with their kids. And, and I'm like, you know. I was in like a little red cardigan or whatever my mom dressed, probably got at CNR or whatever it was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that was like this big ordeal that I was, I shook hands with a thousand people that night. You know, I didn't know who they were. I took pictures. I did all sorts of stuff. And they came out in the theaters and I was just like, wow. And I actually went and saw it a couple of times in the theaters just because I couldn't fathom and it was packed. And movies weren't packed like that back then. Not, not, not cartoon movies. But, but do you have a con did you actually have a concept of, like, I'm in a, a, I mean, a profound concept of, I'm in this major film here. I mean, did you, were you I able did, to I fathom did, it? I didn't understand it. I didn't understand the, the, it took me years and years later. It was really when I started doing, got, I guess, more recognized for doing in front of the camera work, that it'd be, then people would just be all over me about Fievel. So when I was on Full House, and then and on I, my list of stuff to talk about, and, good. Uh, they, I was Danny Tanner. You know, I was Danny. Whenever they flash back when they were kids, that was me as Bob Saget. And because of that role, everyone's like, "Oh, you're." And then when I did that, right after that, I went and did Les Mis for two years in Los Angeles at the Schubert. I played Gavroche, and at that point. All the recognition from that, I always used to make a joke. I won a drama log award, and the first question in the interview was, "What was it like to be Fiebel? I'm like, "Wait a minute, I just, I just won for the role." Yeah, gosh, what the, let's go on. But that's when I started to probably chew. I was probably, I guess, 10 or 11 years old. I probably to understand how massive it was. Years later, we had done a sequel already, uh, and you know, it was just kind of the way it, it all started to, to map itself out. I knew it, but I think that's probably, Dan, when I really realized, like, holy moly, I was in the biggest animated movie of all time at the time. Now, I'll tell you the, the, uh, what really actually set apart Philip's performance as, um, as Fievel is that, especially for nowadays, right, a lot of kids are casted, and in 
mo in motion pictures, and they're always smart now, pretentious. Um, the idea was, it was scripted this way, is that his character was innocent. Um, and it was reflected in your performance. There wasn't a vernacular that you used that was kind of a, you know, oh, you know, uh, kind of a, a smart mouth. Or it wasn't like, Dad, you know, you're, you know, um, you know, it's like, you don't know any better or whatever. Like, it wasn't written like that. It was written to be a true, innocent boy. And your performance, which was, it was great, but it was unrefined. You know what I mean? You didn't have a uh, kind of a, a, a worldly, smart view of the world. It was an innocent view. And that, to me, was the biggest difference. And that's why his, when he sings, that unrefined performance in Somewhere Out There, together with the girl who played, I forget her name, well, the girl singing it was different than the actress. Right, it but it, right, but it was unrefined, uh, and that performance was just great. And uh, they took, I was saying earlier, they took a few, uh, we, we, we had a few other takes where uh, Phil's performance was a, you know, like really spot, more spot on, but we picked the unrefined uh, uh, singing that where his voice cracks, right? And that, to me, to me, that made all the difference in the world. Well, and I think going back to something we talked about this morning, too, was how Spielberg was just listening and listening and listening. And he heard Philip and went, that's it. Go, go do that. And, and he's so in tune. Like, like I said, animation and kids. Yeah. Like, he has this, this sixth sense that a lot of Hollywood doesn't have when it comes to undiscovered talent that... You know, you, I mean, you could just, the list is a mile long of the people that, yeah, he made that person. And you were talking about the Fievel discussion. I hate to call it a guilty pleasure because I'm not ashamed that I love it. I was watching Cloak and Dagger the other day. Okay. <laughs> and one of the extras is a bunch of the press that Henry Thomas and the director did. And I was watching this interview and it was a 10 minute interview and eight minutes of it was just the guy asking Henry Thomas about E.T. And he's like, I got another <laughs> movie to promote, bro. So, so funny. <laughs> well, it's like that guy, if he goes, he's the, he just won, I'm, I'm pretty sure he'll win the Oscar as well from Goonies and- E.K. Kwan. E.K. Kwan. <sighs> like, it's like if people, every one of his interviews, they talk about Goonies, they talk about- Temple of Doom. Oh, Temple of Doom. And it's just like, he's like, I just won. The, uh, the Golden he got Globe. The, and he's got the SAG now, he too. Got the SAG. I mean, I would be shocked if he didn't win the Oscar. And if you haven't seen Everything Everywhere all at it, once. It's really good. It's that and RRR. I'm good for the year. She's just cheesy. I, I would say I put cheesy. And there, I can say better. She was unbelievable, though. Oh, Michelle Yeoh? Yeah. She, oh. she was like, he was amazing and he's great and he's, he deserves it. But her performance, like, I. That, that film works on every level. Yeah, it really, it really did. I really enjoyed it. But um, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, it was just a different world. Like, I would say that Don Bluth and Steven Spielberg were more so Don because he did the directing. Were my first acting coach. I didn't have an acting coach. I didn't know how to do anything. I went into a recording studio, and I would say the lines, and then Don would say, "Let's try it this way," and I do it the way he said, and that's what everybody heard. Yep. Did you have to do a press junket for it? For those of you who know, a press junket is when actors are promoting a film and they basically sit in a room and they just cycle in reporters one after another about every six to seven minutes for about four to six hours on end. And it's the stuff you see where like they're doing an interview and the posters in the background. That usually comes from what we call a press junket. And I'm wondering if you had to do that, and if so, how that was for somebody that was still trying to figure all this out. I don't believe we did it because I don't think anyone knew what American Tale was going to do. So I don't think you had a lot of big stars in it. I remember I did interviews, but I know I know what press junkets are obviously now. I remember I did one with Christopher Plummer. I did one with Madeline Kahn and I did one with Dom DeLuise. And I remember because I sang songs to them and then obviously working with Madeline. I remember doing like little spot things here that I was really a part of. It was mostly their interview. They were more interested in inter obviously interviewing them. I did a ton with Don DeLuise. Out of everyone, I probably did the most because we ended up doing, golly, three or four movies together, a kid's album, a TV series together. So Don and I, we worked together for so many years. Do you have a Don DeLuise story that's your favorite? Um, 
I have a few. <laughs> uh, one Family of, show. One of them we were, now these, they're, they're all good. We were doing uh, the series Fables American Tales for CBS. And Don was uh, you know, always a little bit late for the, uh, the group <laughs> sessions. And you would hear someone in the background. There was always a kid who would work the gate. It was at this uh, cro- you know, crossroads, yeah. Pacific Crossroads Studios there. Yeah. And you'd hear Don screaming through the loudspeaker, somebody open the gate, I'm wearing a limo. And that's all you would hear. <laughs> and he would come running in. He said, I'm, I'm sorry, there was an accident. Bagels were everywhere. And he would come running in with some huge story. And, but it was dumb. Nobody was going to be mad. And then uh, when we were doing, God, it must have been Troll in Central Park. I want to say it is. We were, we were doing Troll in Central Park. It was right before my bar mitzvah. And Dom wanted to do to talk on my bar mitzvah because he couldn't he couldn't make it, so he did this whole speech. It's on my bar mitzvah video somewhere. And he's like, "Listen, everybody, I know you want no, move out of the way, Philip. This is the Dom Delaney <laughs> show." <laughs> and so he starts doing this whole thing about congratulations. Listen, I'll be there, and if I'm not there, I'll be handing out free pens. And that was <laughs> what he said to everybody. And I was just that's just who he was. He was a giant personality. And it was so fun to continually get to have experiences with him, with you know Don Bluth again and Troll in Central Park, and then obviously with Steven again and Fable Goes West and and the series and the kids album. But uh, you know it was just it was just tremendous. But him is probably who I spent the most time with. So Dan, editing this film, first of all, you get to feel all of the things before anybody else does. Is there a specific moment that you it cringed and hurt your soul that were like, I, I don't want this on the floor. This has to be in the print. <laughs> They're all like that. <laughs> no, uh, you know, Stephen had such a really uh, real heavy hand in, you know, the material that was in, and he really wanted it to be authentic and true. Um, so there are... There are a number of scenes that we had in there that just, you know, as an editor, you start looking for areas that are running really slow or not pertinent to the story. And it may be the best sequence in the film, but sometimes for the overall benefit of the film, you throw it out and you put that in the bonus material. Um, But we had, uh, I think it was a very tight script for the most part. Um, like I said, Stephen had a real hand in that. Um, but uh, Don, kind of being the master storyteller, uh, he, really, he really kept a tight rein in on the story. Um, and so a lot of uh, the editing that was in it uh, uh, ended up being just kind of like just tightening up scenes or whatever for the most part. Uh, but he is, uh, I mean, it was... Uh, it was a pleasure to to work to edit that film. I've done three films with Stephen. That was American Tale, Land of Four Time, and then later on, uh, a film called El Dorado, mm. uh, the Road to El Dorado, um, and uh, which is interesting because here's a little side story, a little fun fact here. So after uh, Land of Four Time, it's been like it was like ten years until we did the Road to El Dorado, and I. Uh, after our first screening, we went and uh, did a, uh, we had a session up, upstairs, a note session. And so I was walking out of the theater after the screening. There's a door that opens up behind me. I look back there, and it's Stephen. I go, hey. I said, Stephen, you looking for the note session? He goes, yeah. And so I said, it's over here. So we get in there, and we get in the elevator and push the button. And I'm just going like, I wonder if he can. I wonder if he knows me like that. <laughs> remembers me. So I go, uh, Stephen, hey, I don't think you probably he goes, yes, I do, Dan Molina. <laughs> I was like, okay. Like, you all I heard, mean, he, he knew my first and last name. You all heard right. that, right? Okay. It's like, I, somehow I got on your radar in your life, you know. But he seems like that guy. He like, is that guy. when you work with him, he's that guy. Because he, uh, yeah. uh, he does use a lot of the same people and things, but he's always that guy that will always know you for the work you've done for him. Yeah, I actually, you're abs- abs- you're absolutely right. Um, during the course of the mix, because we did the mix in London, uh, the final mix of the show, um, he was working on Raiders at that time, uh, the second Raiders, 
and I was on uh, this film. And so at the end of the day, he would uh, go from the stage shooting uh, Raiders, and then he would come and we would play back uh, the film. And um, he, every session, it was amazing just to hear him talk about this fountain of knowledge in his head mm-hmm. and his recollection, recollection of movies. I mean, just, you know, explaining, talking about something. Yeah, it's like that movie, blah, blah, blah. And it was just, I was awestruck. I think, I honestly think that, um, and it benefited me greatly because he knew I was really young. I was 25. It was my first feature film. And I think he knew that. And so I think he was exceptionally kind to me, you know. Uh, and I, and I'll, I'll always be grateful for that. Um, but adamant in what he wanted. And remember, this is about you guys. I mean, I love talking to these guys, and I can do this all day. But if you guys have questions, we've got mics on either end of the room. Grab up some, and you can ask your questions to these guys. Otherwise, I'm going to keep talking because I want to talk deep cuts, too. Our other moderators this weekend, our boys from Tulsa that are in town, they're Star Trek guys. Okay. And there's a credit on your IMDb page (laughs) that we have to talk about. We, uh, we're, we're rolling, right, Tarek? Because they're not in the room. They're going to freak out when they see this. You were in Insurrection, sir. I was. Uh, you know, I'd never done any Star Trek, and I was on... What show? I was on, I guess, Hang Time at the time. I was doing a TV show on M- NBC, and I got a call saying, listen, I want you to go audition on the Paramount lot. It was to play a young version of F. Murray Abraham. He was mm-hmm. a bad guy, and they needed... He was like 180... So you need someone to play him from like eight, 16 to 80. Through like, you started how you look now, and then they'll metamorph you into something else. And Jonathan Frakes was the director. And uh, I'm like, okay, cool. So I went and I met with Jonathan, and he's like, yep. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not gonna. Do I read anything? Like, no, nah, we don't even. Know, we don't even know if we need you to talk. But you look just like F. Murray Abraham. Well, and you said that, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah and I'm like, cool. This works out. I can audition like this. And he was so cool. And I can tell you this, that was one of the hardest shoots I've ever done for something where I think I said two words in the movie, if I even said anything. Because it's, I think they actually deleted it from the movie, but it's in the DVD. Oh, I've got all the two discs for, sets. For, from, for, the, for deleted scenes, because it was an alternate ending where he morphs. F. Murray Abraham Rafo morphs back to when he was a kid then morphs back to his age like yelling and screaming and he explodes. That was like his original death. And we sat there on the Paramount lot, like I want to say it's four consecutive days of 17 hour days. Oh geez. So I didn't even leave my trailer. I just would sleep in my dressing room. I'm like, I'm not driving back to the valley. Yeah. And I just stayed there. And Jonathan was so, it was so important to him because there was all these tech cranes and things and we were on a green screen. But the reason it really took so long is every stage of my morph took two and a half hours. Take off all the makeup. I mean, I was, I can literally say I was sleeping in some of those times <laughs> when they were putting all the stuff on my Just face. let me know when we're done. And there's pictures. If you just type Philip Glass or Star Trek, you can see there is a shot of one of the stages of me between 16 and 84. I want to say it was my age range. <laughs> um, it was a very large net cast. It was. It was, it was really incredible, though. I mean... I, I enjoyed working and I there even is on my table like a, everyone I keep them now because every once in a while a true Star Trek fan will ask for it. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna say something to John when he comes back. Ter- See, Tarek's the only one in the room, so he gets to hear it first. So, and we'll talk about it later. We got a couple of questions going over Your name, sir. My name is Sean Burge, and I have a question for Phil. Sure. sure. How was it on the set of Boy Meets World, Saved by the Bell, the new class, and Sabrina, the Teenage Witch? All right, now, now you're stealing my bit with the deep cuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Saved by the Bell, the new class was awesome because I was, so I was on the show right after it, Hang Time. So I came over and I did that one first, I think before I even started on Hang Time. I was just, it was working a week, uh, was actually just talking about this, so Richard Jackson, who is the star of Saved by the Bell, the new class, actually lives now in Franklin and our kids go to school together. So I'm talking wow. about jumping. Wow. So we were literally talking about it. He's like, dude, didn't you do an app? Because we knew each other from the promos. Because Hang Time and Saved by the Bell would do all the 
promo stuff. He's like, but you did like a guest star once. I said, I sure did. I did it before hang time. And we were talking about it because his daughter and my son are in the same, same grade at the same school. Oh, wow. And uh, we were recently talking about it. So Saved by the Bell the Glass was a total blast. But here we are, you know, 20-something years later, and it still exists. Uh, Boy Meets World was another blast. So ever since I did that episode of Boy Meets World, which was called it was actually just talked about. So there's a podcast that Ryder Strong and Danielle Fischel, mm-hmm. so they just talked about me like two weeks ago. So my phone starts blowing up. They're going like, dude, Ryder and Danielle and Will are talking about you because I guess they said, dude, did you know that guy was Fivel? Like, yeah, there he is. <laughs> and then they said, and Ryder's like, no. And the Ryder's like, actually, no, I knew Phil because Phil was Gavroche and Les Mis. And then when he finished, I did it in San Francisco. And you text him, thank you for doing yeah. the non vival yeah. stuff. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it was just kind of random how that came out 20-something years later. It was a great role, super fun to get to work with Ben. Ben and I remained friends for years, personally. Like, we, we got along. We lived down the street from each other growing up as kids. So we always kind of knew each other, but we didn't really hang out. But after that, we started to hang out. And then Sabrina was really, uh, was really a blast. I did several episodes of Sabrina, only in the first season, because my character, they couldn't really find a name for my I don't even know if I had a legal name. It's every episode. But I did several episodes because I was kind of Nate's friend. But I would always be really mean to Sabrina. So the problem is, well, they started dating season two. So that kind of <laughs> never brought my character back. Sure. They're not going to bring the jerk back. But that was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. I loved working with Nate and Melissa uh, Joan Hart, who also now lives in Nashville with me. So here you are. <laughs> 20 some years later and everybody's kind of back uh back in nashville hanging out again thank you a great question and we got one over here oh, give some love to him for that wonderful question y'all all right let's go over here your name uh lucy lucy what can we do for you okay so i have a question about um the releases of an american tale and anyone who knows the answer feel free to say so I was first introduced to it an american tale through cartoon networks cartoon theater you know they would show the movie um on Cartoon Network during the day. And I noticed that in that scene, uh, Warren T. Rat has just left. Um, Five old falls through the hole. And then he wakes up and there are these, these three little boys there. And I noticed that in the version that was released, um, that was posted, that was put, broadcasted by Cartoon Network, the boys sound much younger than they do on the DVD releases. And so, yeah. You have one version of the film where the boys sound very young, and then you have another version of the film where um, one boy has a has like a gravel to his voice, and the other, you know, sounds like a teenager, like whatever. Um, and so I, I was wondering, um, do y'all know how um, why one cut of the film has like two two younger voices and the other has another pair of voices? Like, how did that come? How, how did that come about? Shout out to Lucy for that level of research. Wow. Well, That's all you, buddy. <laughs> well, there's a, YouTube vid- there, there's a YouTube video that compares both versions of that scene, and yep. so I've always wondered why. You're absolutely right. And uh, I would never have known about this uh, had I not gotten a call from Gary Goldman, uh, one of the producers there, and he asked me about that. And he said, did we revoice and, and have another... and." As far as I know, when I go back to the movie, those are the voices I cut in. And I, I remember that performance. And then I did hear what you're talking about, and it is a different voice, and I have no idea. It's one of those great mysteries. Uh, one of these days I will find out, because I'm going to inquire with a person that I know that was in post-production at Universal during that time and ask him. I think he had something to do with the final mix uh, but I'm going to ask him about that. But it, it's really, it's odd. And uh, I don't have a good question. But so you're right. You're absolutely so right. So the theatrical was one set of voices and the home video was another? There's a, at least, I think it's it's one or two of the characters just sound different. Two of the characters. Two of the characters. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's, it, you listen to it and you go, oh, it is different, and like you said, one of them has a really gravelly voice, um, but they are not. I don't know whether maybe there was something legally that uh, awesome. went on with the, you know, with their contracts or something. That's but really funny. It's it it's, is. It's like when you back in the day when we'd watch movies on 
broadcast television and they would have to change certain words and yeah. sometimes it wasn't even close yeah, oh, yeah. Like, i want to say it was like the first police academy was on nbc and the guy was like nobody better mess with me yeah <laughs> something, well, I... something went wrong there but you also worked on another film that i feel doesn't get enough love and it was a little opus called chicken little Oh, yeah. Chicken oh, Little. Can we talk a little bit about Chicken Little and your experience there? Yeah. Um, so Chicken Little was a film that, uh, so I have a friend of mine who's the director, Mark Dindle, and he called me to do Chicken Little. Prior to Chicken Little, he called me to do another film, lesser known film, called Emperor's New Groove. Oh. Uh, and I, that, those, I, that, that just showed up on TV the other day, and I was like, oh, stop down. In, and I want to watch it for like an hour and a half. Oh, <laughs> it's just... I'm telling you, that film has such a following. And to this day, I will regret my decision, which was I turned him down. Oh. I turned him down because I was already on another film. And uh, it just didn't work out. But I look at that film and I go, oh my, ah, I just wish I could have worked on that film. But it is um, Chicken Little. I, then I, I got back together with him to do Chicken Little. Uh, it was a great film to work on. Again, Mark Dindle's brand of humor. Um, we had a lot of political problems at that time, just with the studio in general. Uh, wanting, we started out with Chicken Little being a girl. It was Holly Hunter, who was the voice. Oh, wow. And we went through a whole two recording sessions with her as voicing it, and, uh, and she was great. And then Michael Eisner, who was the head of uh, at that time, and Jeffrey Katzenberger, but it was Michael Eisner who wanted to go, you know what, I don't think it should be a girl. I think it should be a boy. Because of my days in Boy, in boy Scouts, and I love those days, so let's let it be a boy. And so we went back to Ground Zero and had to redo the entire film. Um, so Chicken Little became a boy. Um, and uh, interesting enough, uh, while we were doing the film, we had the character fish out of water, you know, the fish with the helmet. And uh, Michael Eisner wanted him to speak. And I said to the guys, guys, he shouldn't speak. We, gotta, we, we need to have this character just be phys you know, visual. And all the humor or whatever come out of just his, you know, the physical humor. Um, and uh, so he... Michael Eisner insisted that it should be, you know, he should speak. And I said, okay, hold on a second, guys. Give me one night and let me do something here and I'll, I'll show you tomorrow. So I went home and I had this idea. Okay, I'm going to do just a squeaky voice and I'm going to do it through a tube that goes into an Arrowhead water bottle and the bubbles will come out. So when I laugh, <laughs> it go to, it, it, the bubbles were tailored. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so the next day they come in, the, the pr producer Randy Fulmer and Mark, and he, they said, uh, okay, what do you got? <laughs> so I did the voice for them, and then I already had it cut into the film. Uh, and mind you, I did not think that it was my voice that was going to be in it, but I thought, this is a way to save this character, so at least it would be nonverbal performance, but have some of something of what Michael wanted. Uh, anyway, they liked the idea, then we screened the film with this performance, and uh, it, it got such a big feedback from the fo audience focus uh, that they really loved Fish, and they loved like the bubble voice or whatever, that <laughs> Mark and Randy came in the next day and said, okay, you got it. You got the voice. And so, it's like, Bubble no, I, voices and grunting have, have been, if we miss no. it this morning, he's also the voice of Dirk the Daring in Dragon's Lair, and it was because of the grunting that got you that. I'm seeing a pattern here. I, o I, only, I only speak two words in my entire vocal <laughs> career. Uh, awesome. But no, everything is grunt and grunts and groans and uh, yeah, yeah, anyway. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Great question. That's a great question. And a great shirt as well. Yeah. We're getting a little bit short on time, and I told you earlier today there's something we have to talk about. Okay. Because... Hit me. And this is actually kind of timely now. Okay. Next month is the 20th anniversary of an album called Be a Man that is getting re-released. Okay. It is the... And this is an actual thing. You can Google this. It is the hip-hop album recorded by one macho man, Randy Savage. 
So all I can hear is dig it, and that's all I can hear. But you, you one of your last commercials, if not your last commercial, if, for, for those of you that remember in the 90s, Macho Man was a spokesperson for Slim Jims. Welcome to someone who was in the commercial with him. <laughs> And I, I, want, I want to know what your experiences were like with Savage because for somebody like me who's ingrained in the world of professional wrestling since I was knee-high to a grasshopper, I do a whole podcast that. about it, but I hear such amazing things about him. So I, listen, I've never, and I, like, that's really why I used, I went through a phase where I did like 40 commercials. I had an Ego Waffle commercial that was on for like a year and a half. Wow. And you've all seen it. You just don't realize it. <laughs> that was you? It was, there was a, <laughs> it, was that, it was this big, it's when they started that rap for Ego Mini Waffles. Oh. So those three kids rapping. And that was me. And I just, they kept saying, oh, we're going to keep using. They kept, because with SAG, the way it worked, they had to keep recycling it. They only had it for so long. And they keep, I'm like, well, let's go, guys. We can keep, you can pay me as long as you yeah. want, Egos. And then I did like Kellogg's. And I was on the Frosted Flakes sports one with hockey. I was the bully, funny enough. Like the kid, <laughs> you know, like the kids like shooting hockey. He's like, can I play? I'm like, I don't know. Can you? You know, that guy. Uh, super fun, though. And it was just commercials. Like, I never really knew the world of commercials because it was easy. You worked a day or two, and they, you know, back then, now it's changed now because there's all these buyout stuff, but you would make a tremendous amount of money for one or two days' work in the future of residuals because every time they were cycles, they played that commercial, they had to pay you, which is crazy, especially when it was and if, Especially if it was something aimed at kids because you knew it was going to be done ad nauseum. C correct. And so I get this call saying, hey, why don't you audition uh, for... Uh, Slim Jim commercial and there was only one other I think before that was the library one and I'm like oh my gosh that's Macho Man Ran I was a massive WWF fan I don't I'm not saying WWE back I'm then it was it, but back then it was, it was WWF is that's what it was I mean I had 450 shirts that I would rip out saying I'm a real American as the Hulk uh, coming into a ring and it was a big part of my life growing up and so I go in, he wasn't, of course, in any of the auditions or anything. I get the part, I'm like, yes. So they send me to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and day one, we're there, and there he is, you know. Wasn't in all the macho gear, but had, guy was cut, uh, and Miss Elizabeth wasn't with him. Uh, I don't think they were together at the time, but I was heartbroken. Yeah, by the time they got married on television, they had been married and divorced. Correct. Which I was very strange. So I was, I, that was the first question I asked him because we thought, I mean, on TV, I think they were still married. And he's like, oh, yeah, she's not here. I'm like, <laughs> yes, sir. And I'll never forget, I'm going in there and there is a, is, I have a very neurotic Jewish mother. So let me just start with, the story with saying that. And he's coming out of the elevator, going into the elevator. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to the elevator. My mom pulls me back. She's like, you're not riding in there with him. I'm like, what do you mean? It's Macho Man Randy Sam. She's like, I don't know who he is. And I'm like, like you, turn on a I'm TV. like, mom, I'm like, wake up, you're <laughs> freaking out. And she didn't understand that was the guy I'm doing the commercial with. So we get to working on this commercial. And a Slim Jim commercial is an absolute train wreck because it's just, <laughs> first of all, my mouth after I'd say two and a half or three days, I couldn't take get the t taste of Tabasco out of it because. Oh, it was I, the Tabasco one. Because you, you would spit it, you'd spit in a bucket, but every bite, it was that you, the flavors in your mouth, and it was the most awful, foul aftertaste that you could ever imagine. Because it's like Tabasco with some probably some kind of acid or something that they put Beef in there. Beef jerky food. I think that's what I call Processed it. food. <laughs> but like we just did it over and over because it wasn't, you did the bites before the big stuff happened. I mean, we had pies in our face, chicken feathers, because it was a barnyard dance. And it was just chaos. It was me and this kid named Scott White, who uh, was on a show called Skid City Guys. So we, were, we worked together on that, because he was right after hang time. And then he was like, uh, if you're any Mighty Ducks fans, he was in one of the Mighty Ducks where he was like the bad guy from Iceland. I think it was the playing, second, second one? Second one where they're playing the I world think, games. Yeah, I think it was Jupiter. the second one. Really good guy, and we were just like, we were beat up, and, and Randy thought it was hilarious, because every time we get in a pie base, we're like, <laughs> <laughs> like, he wasn't big, he wasn't big laughing, we're like, uh, that was pretty funny, yeah. <laughs> That's what he would do, and he was, he was super nice, you know, he was really fun to work with, I mean, he, but he, they, they did it to him too, I mean, he had to, hmm. 
eat those things and bite those things. But I'll tell you, I didn't eat Slim Jims for years after that commercial because I was, and it wasn't that I didn't like them because I wasn't eating them, but like that taste was so oh, hard I can't even imagine. to erase from my mouth. And then once again, just like that commercial came out and just exploded. And I remember going to prom. Uh, I was, I was probably like, I think I did. I was like a sophomore in high school, maybe. And I went to prom with a senior. That's right. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I went there and like, for once, all everybody wanted to talk about, oh my God, it's a Slim Jim guy. <laughs> Not one five will comment the whole night. <laughs> You're like, Slim like, Jim shit. Yeah, really. That's our Slim Jim. That's right. Keep talking, buddy. <laughs> and now as that like, the prom date like hated me because like, she's, I'm like, listen, I, what do you want me to do? I'm yeah. at a commercial. I can't, like, that's all everybody wanted to talk about. At like our table, I'm like, she's like, well, yeah, we're. I'm like, well, we're not dating, so just we'll go back to Slim Jim. <laughs> so that was my uh, my Slim Jim memory. That once again, another thing that a lot of people don't know about, but I appreciate you bringing that up. When you we talked about it last time, yeah. it was right after the panel, and I'm like, if I ever get to sit down with Philip Glasser again, right, we have to talk about this. It was so fun. Those commercials were great. Those were those commercials that they just they would keep on the air for a while back yeah. then, like the Frosted Flakes. They had well, and Slim Jim was such a big sponsor of WCW at that Correct. point. Like the ring posts looked like Slim oh, Jim and Macho was there. Yeah. Every night, Monday Night Nitro, I was on. I'm like, I'm the coolest guy in the world. And at all that my point, friends are watching this. Well, and at that point, they were trouncing Raw in the ratings yep. too. So sure. that you that CS saw even more eyes. Sure. And they were national, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And they I mean I, I think at that point it would have had to have been international. The that commercial, that one and I think the for me the Ego Waffles and the Frosted Flakes, those three, like I can just, you know, tell you from a, no, I was known, I would get stopped by people, like, you know, like a celebrity would in the street, and I would, didn't consider myself of that nature, but I would get stopped by people all the time for those, more than I'm on a series every Saturday morning, <laughs> no one even wants to talk about it. <laughs> but like, it's, you're the Slim Jim guy, you're the Frosted Flakes guy, oh dude, you're the Eggo Waffles guy. But that's what happened, because they would play everywhere. They would play absolutely everywhere at all times of the day and night, and they didn't stop it. Because commercials now, they, they run for, what, 30 days sometimes, and they're gone. Mm -hmm. This thing ran for over a year. It, it was a lot easier to have that happen back yeah, then because it wasn't, it wasn't the right now culture of consume, consume, consume. Right. We're running short on time, yep. and as you know, whenever I, I moderate a panel, I try to save that last five minutes for blatant self-promotion. So people that want to get in contact with you, want to follow you on social media, how do they do it? Really? <laughs> you can't get a hold of me. <laughs> He's off the grid. I am off the grid. You don't want to talk to us. Right. <laughs> if you really want to get a hold of me, you could go through actually CelebWorks, and they would go ahead and wonderful contact people. Me. We love yeah. CelebWorks. Um, I, I have an official Philip Glasser Instagram. It's probably the the most popular mm -hmm. one. I'm still learning how to do it, so please be gentle. I don't. I don't post 40 times a day. I'm still understanding this uh, generation, but I'm trying to. And listen, uh, you know, we got lots of movies coming out. Uh, we have another one coming out this fall that I produced called Camp Hideout with Christopher Lloyd and uh, Corbin Blue from High School Musical and Amanda Layton from This Is Us. Great, fun, Home Alone meets Ernest Goes to Camp kids movie. Should be out in theaters in October. I don't have a date yet. And, um, and then my last documentary that I produced was called... Um, um, my God, the, the last kick. It's the it's the true untold story of the FIFA documentary about the FIFA scandal. Oh wow! We, we talked about that last time, yeah, just so, a little bit. Yeah, so it opened up last month in Amazon in the UK and all over the world, and then I don't know what the release date, but it's this year in the US. And if you don't think your phone is listening to you, I will prove it. Oh yeah. The last time we had a conversation, we talked about another deep cut. If you remember, an animated film called Baby's Kids. Oh. <laughs> he was in this. The Blu-ray got released like a month later. <laughs> I'm like, because I was like, I want the Blu-ray, and then ask and ye shall receive. It was your guy. We were talking about that earlier. I think the uh, volunteer at his table was the first thing came up to me and says, yeah. you, were, you were Opie and Bebe's kids. <laughs> yep. I said, I sure was. Uh, another one of those movies uh, that I knew who Robin Harris was because I'd seen his stand-up routine before I went in, and I didn't even audition. I just, they literally just called me and says, you're doing this role. And I said, okay. And 
what an absolute blast. I mean, that was a Tone Loke is a toddler. Yeah. <laughs> the whole concept was so underrated. It's just when they released it, I think they released it as a kid's movie, and it's not. Yeah, it's It's really like not. South Park. It's for an older audience. But it was super fun to work on. It's, if you look it up if you haven't seen it. It's a wonderful film. Gentlemen, getting to talk to you twice today. I'm like, they're like yeah. I'm, I am living the dream. That's all I'm saying. Dan Molina, Philip Glass, y'all give him some love, please. Thank you.